Hello, Community West Church. Welcome to Church in the Home Online. Please continue with the weekly scripture reading. You will find the Bible passages on Planning Center. Prayer requests and announcements can be submitted to communitywestchurch at gmail.com. Today's message is part four in the David King of Israel series, Intimacy with God. The core of this message is the human need to experience intimacy with a holy God. Um, turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel 6 and follow along as I read a few passages here. Starting with verse 1. David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty who was enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ao, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ao was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. And let me pause for a moment to satiate your curiosity about sistrums. If you're not familiar with sistrums, they are a U-shaped metal frame with a wooden handle made of brass or bronze. They're typically about 16 inches tall and they look a little bit like a mini tennis racket kind of squish. They are played by shaking back and forward, or back and forward. Uh, different sizes of sistrums produce different uh, sounds. So now let's get back to verse 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath was, had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah, which translates as outbreak against Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the Ark of God. So David went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. So after seven years of a brutal civil war, King Saul was killed in battle, and as God promised, David was crowned king of Israel. David decided to move the Ark of the Covenant, a powerful religious symbol for the entire nation, to the capital city of Jerusalem. Twenty years ago, the Philistines had captured the Ark in battle, but it brought them so much stress and judgment that they put it on an ox cart, pointed it in the direction of Jerusalem, and let it go. For 20 years, the ark was stored in a remote area at the house of a man named Abinadab. Now in 2 Samuel 6, the first verse tells us that 30,000 armed soldiers marched up to Abinadab's front door and requested the ark. Wow, that's a lot of guys to come to the front door. For Abinadab, the ark had been a curse, so he gladly released the ark to David, who was so excited about the return of the ark that he and his fellow countrymen rejoiced with singing and dancing. And then, as the Israelites were proceeding with the ark on the ox cart, the oxen stumbled. Uzzah reached out to steady the ark, and when his hands touched, Uzzah dropped dead. Angered by the Lord's wrath and Uzzah's shocking death, David, who was frustrated and not a little frightened, cried out asking, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? Unwilling to take the ark to be with him in the city, David sent the ark to the home of Obed-Edom where God blessed that man and his entire family. Three months passed, 
David decides it's time to make another attempt to move the ark to the city of David. This time the party went as planned, and there was great rejoicing as the ark arrived at its rightful home. The Bible tells us that David danced with all his might. Now this is the kind of story that makes some people not believe in the Bible. Who wants to worship a God who can be angry, vindictive, unfair, and even mean? Or for those who believe the Bible, this kind of story can create fear and insecurity in our relationship with God. It is not the kind of relationship with God that Paul talks about when he wrote, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to relationship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So how can we experience this level of intimacy and safety and security with God? The story tells me I must be careful. God might strike me too. So let's see if we can answer some questions that will draw us closer to God. First, why is the ark so important and why did David want it? Why did God smite or kill Uzzah? Why did David dance and rejoice before the Lord with all his might? And what difference does any of this make in our lives today? These are difficult questions. Part of our problem when we read this story or any biblical story is that we lack context. Context makes all the difference. I'll give you an example. Let's say you saw a video of an old man dressed in rags, covered with dirt, wearing a ragged beard. He lives in a hole, apparently homeless, poor, and vulnerable. Suddenly, the video pans out and you watch in horror as a truckload of armed men swoop down, shouting, pointing guns, and threatening the old man. It seems so unfair, so unkind, and even brutal, until you're told that the men in the truck are U.S. Army, and the man in the hole, dressed in rags, covered with dirt, wearing a ragged beard, is Saddam Hussein. Then you say, oh, now I know why the soldiers acted that way. When you understand the context, the rest of the details make sense. In the same way, we need to understand the context of David's story. This is what we want to understand. What was the ark, and why did David want it? The Ark of the Covenant was a chest or box about four feet long and about two feet wide and two feet deep, all overlaid with gold. The solid gold lid was called the Mercy Seat. Unlike the Ark in the Raiders of the Lost Ark movies, the Ark of the Covenant did not have magical properties, and people suffered God's wrath, or nor did people suffer God's wrath when they tried to use it like a spell or a charm. The ark symbolized something for the ancient follower of Yahweh, just as the bread and cup we use during the Lord's Supper symbolized something for us. After delivering Israel from slavery and making a covenant with them, God instructed them to build the ark. He said, There, above the cover, between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the covenant law, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. There I will meet with you. This is God's promise, his covenant. The ark was a place of intimacy between God and his people. It was the place where the glory, literally the heaviness or the weightiness, the experiential reality of God dwelt among them. They felt it. They lived in that glory and mercy. And all this intimacy, living in the glory of God, living in a vital relationship with God, was purely God's initiative, God's gift of radical free grace. Why then was David so anxious to possess the ark? It is likely that David may have wanted it for political reasons, but we also know that David hungered for intimacy with God. Listen to David's prayer in Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing I asked from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze at the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. That is the cry of David's heart, to know God, 
not just to have data about God, but to live intimately with God, to have the kind of relationship Paul talked about in which we cry out, Abba, Father. The ark represented that spiritual reality. It is one thing to know facts about God. God loves me. My sins are forgiven. God is for me. It is another thing to have that reality come alive in your heart, to feel the weight of it pressing on your life, to know God's love and presence and power governing your life more than anything else. Now, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks or how well you perform or whether you fail or succeed because God is more real than the opinions of others. David wanted the ark because it represented that intimacy with God, that security. David needed, and, and he would need it every day of his life, a joy and security deeper than his circumstances. David hungered for intimacy with God. And that leads us to the big question of today. Why did Uzzah die? Our context will help us better understand Uzzah's death. In the Bible, God made it clear that there were certain rules for moving the ark. Exodus 25 says that they were to uh, cast these rings and fasten them and make poles and, and do all of that. First, God said that the ark must be carried. That is why they fitted the ark with the golden rings and the poles. They would go over the, the shoulders of those who carried the ark. Second, the ark would be carried by a group called the Korahites. Think of them as the spiritual green beret of another group called the Levites, a special priestly class of people. And third, God said that no one, not anyone, was to touch it. The people in that parade disregarded every one of these rules. So is that why God smote Uzzah? Because he broke the rules? If that's the case, then we would probably say, that's why I don't believe in God or religion. It's all just a bunch of rules. Or, that is why I would never get close to God. He's waiting for me to break the rules and then wham, God will zap me with something really terrible. Many of us live with a deep-seated dread that our relationship with God is based on keeping the rules. And we break the rules all the time. We must understand that breaking rules is just a symptom. The rules are all about God and our relationship with God. The rules say that there's something unique about God. God is holy. That means that there's a chasm between God and us, a huge, uncrossable chasm. You can't bridge it. You can't just say, I'm a good person. I do nice things. I go to church. I'm righteous and moral, and I help God out. So now God owes me. That is the Uzzah approach to God. Uzzah was not evil, but he was certainly not innocent either. God did not smite Uzzah for just one petty rule violation. In his book, David Leap Over a Wall, Eugene Peterson wrote, Uzzah's death was not sudden. It was years in the making. Touching the ark was the final straw, not the singular sin. Was God harsh and, and unjust with Uzzah? Absolutely not. God is just, but for years God had chosen to forego his justice and extended mercy to Uzzah. Uzzah knew all about the holiness of God. He was raised and trained as a Korahite. Um, and these were descendants of the sons of Korah. They were an important branch of the singers of the Korahite division, as noted in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 19. The sons of Korah were the sons of Moses' nephew, Korah. Uzzah knew that you cannot just come crashing into God's presence, nor can you work your way into God's presence by being a good moral person. But he decided to ignore what he knew, and he loaded the ark onto the ox cart. Why? Because in his mind, he knew better than God. There is some controversy regarding Uzzah's death. Did Uzzah deliberately ignore God's law when he adjusted the ark as it started to fall? Or was it a spontaneous reaction? Over the years, I've read various Christian writers and Christian publications with their own insight into this situation. If I put myself into Uzzah's position, how would I not, in a moment of crisis, as the ark begins to fall, without even thinking it through, not reach out to protect God? The ark did not just represent God's presence. It was God's presence for his people. It would be just a natural reaction to reach out and stop it from falling. 
Our second guessing of this situation matters little because either way it has a diamond. So let's look at it again and see if there's something we missed. It is possible that Uzzah thought he was protecting God by adjusting the ark as it started to fall. Or maybe he believed he could manage and control God. I don't know. God said, do not touch the ark because my holiness dwells in the ark. If you touch it, you will die. Okay, we understand that. However, God never said that it could not touch the earth. There's nothing wrong with soil. Soil does exactly what God created it to do. We don't. We do not live the way God intended us to live, with absolute love and integrity and trust. We have committed cosmic treason against God. The soil has not. What about the holiness of God? Uzzah's entire life belittled God's holiness. If we begin believing that we can manage God through our religious behavior or our moral efforts, we will assume that God owes us, that God is on our side, and that we take care of God, not vice versa. Uzzah rejected God's solution, the solution of radical grace. Was God being mean and vindictive with Uzzah? I don't think so. For years, God had extended mercy to me. I am borrowing some thoughts from Pastor Tim Keller. He's a theologian and pastor of Redeemer City Church uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Keller describes how an Uzzah-like approach to God, that is, when we think we've earned God's presence and now God owes us, leads to three paths. One, we grow cold and proud. We believe we have earned God's presence, so we must be better than those around us. Two, we attempt to manage God. We have helped God, so we must run the universe and our lives in the ways we think that He should. When we suffer, we then get bitter and resentful. Number three, we realize that we cannot earn God's presence because we keep messing up and falling into habitual sin. Now these three are really the equivalent of living with shame and guilt. We do that in our lives. Spiritual pride, confusion, bitterness, shame, guilt. We see these attitudes everywhere. We are more like Uzzah than, than we would like to admit. Uzzah's approach to the spiritual life in Christ is lethal. It's deadly. It kills the spirit. It kills our relationship with God. I had a note in a file. I have a sermon file with all my ideas for sermons. And I found a note I'd written when I was reading through this passage that Uzzah was dead before he touched the ark. Uzzah died spiritually the moment he thought he could keep God safely in a box. When God struck Uzzah dead, he interrupted the parade and awakened the entire nation. And that leads us to this question. Why did David dance with all this money? 2 Samuel 6, 9 tells us that David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? So David awakens and sees the reality of the chasm. How can the ark of the Lord come to me? He cries out in verse 9. He understands the chasm. He understands that God is holy and that we are flawed and awful. He understands the bad news of the gospel. We are worse off than we would ever dare to admit. The New Testament puts it this way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is us. That is also bad news. So why did David, why did David um, dance with all his might? Why did David start the party again, strip down to his boxer shorts, and go wild with a crazy, knee-slapping, God-exalting, song-raising, shouting dance of praise to God? Because David did not just understand the chasm, the bad news. He understood God's mercy and his radical grace. We see a small taste of this grace in the episode with Obed-Edom. After Uzzah dropped dead and the party ended, the ark wound up at Obed-Edom's house. We know nothing about this man, except that he was a Gittite, which means he's a foreigner or an outsider. After Obed-Edom housed the ark for three months, God not only blessed him, but also his entire family. Now why did God not smite this guy too? What did Obed-Edom do that was so special? Nothing. He did not try to manage God, control God, or get God in his debt because he's such a good moral person. No, Obed-Edom placed his faith in the radical grace of God.
like waking up from a bad dream, David gets it. That is the only way to come to God, by radical grace. David should have known this, but like us, he and his people keep forgetting, kept forgetting. God told his people to place a mercy seat on the top of the ark made of solid gold. Every year the mercy seat was sprinkled with the blood of sacrifice. This was because God wanted to show visibly, unforgettably, and viscerally that forgiveness always costs something dear. It costs a life. We know this instinctively. If someone hurts you or hurts someone you love, you can't just walk away and say, oh, no big deal, I forgive. Somehow there must be amends, an atonement, a debt must be paid. For the relationship to be restored, someone must pay the price and bridge the chasm. Now I struggled to come up with an anecdote to illustrate this and then suddenly stumbled across an interesting story in the news. This dog and cat pair are, as you can see, good friends. I did not want to use uh, imagery depicting injury to animals. So here's the true story that neither of these two participated in. A cat wandered into the yard of a neighbor and was attacked by a dog, which nearly chewed the cat to death. The cat was mangled and bloody. The owner of the cat was angry, but he was realistic and decided to have the poor mangled cat put to sleep. But then, his kind-hearted wife refused. She loved that cat. So he took the cat, the injured cat, to the vet. The final bill was not cheap, but someone had to pay that bill. So the owner of the cat went to his neighbor and asked him to share part of the cause. Excuse me. Legally, the neighbor had little or no culpability, but he also did not have a fence around his yard. The neighbor agreed to split the cost. He paid 25% of the bill cat owner paid the rest. My reasoning for this last anecdote is simple. Someone must pay the bill. The cat owner forgave his neighbor. He even forgave the dog. But the bill had to be paid. Here is the good news of the gospel. God was prepared to pay the price for us. We committed cosmic treason against God. But when God, when Christ died on the cross, he bore our sin. Christ paid our debts. David understood, or at least had a foretaste, of that radical intimacy. That is why David danced and danced with all his might. He danced with reckless abandon. He danced and did not care what anyone else thought about his dancing. He danced because the glory and presence and grace of God was so heavy, so palpable in his life that he could feel it. He knew the weightiness of God, the glory of God, the grace of God that he did not deserve. God had bridged the gap. David saw the justice and holiness of God. When God awakened him, David saw the incredible, radical grace of God that set his heart free. Let's conclude with prayer. Lord God Almighty, you have already revealed the fullness of your love for us through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has paid our debt. We no longer need to carry the burden of our sin. I pray that everyone who hears this message knows that your heart is focused on our hearts, and that in Christ, through Christ, and with Christ, every sin has been nailed to the cross. We no longer need to bear the, the condemnation of sin. We are free, free to approach you, the everlasting God, the holy God, the same God that met David, and the prophets and the disciples. Now we can approach you, holy God, and say, Father, I am hurting today. Father, I have fallen into sin. Help me, save me, cleanse me. And he will. He will help us. You will. You will help us, Lord. You will save us and you will cleanse us. We praise your name and all your works, Lord God. Amen.